Okay, so that brings us to the God Deeds mindset and legacy. When I go to do the dishes, one of the lessons that I learn from a dish or any inanimate object I've got is it basically goes like this. What if that were a person? There are so many people in this world who are helpless. I mean, we all are, but relative to each other, most of us are, are, I don't know if I can say most of us. Most of us in the developed world, is that even true? Some of us, I guess I have to say, are, you know, pretty comfortable, relatively speaking, and are pretty capable of doing things. But there are a whole lot of helpless people out there. Now, down here, I'm sorry, down here the helpless people are not entirely, but often helpless due to circumstance. You know, I keep on thinking about the folks in Nigeria in Kenya and I'm not sure what it's, the right name of it is if it's Zaire or another country where they had an election after a very long civil war and Frontline did a thing on this woman who was running for public office based on Deuteronomy 28 that was her platform And she herself lived in a thatch hut. One room, thatch hut. She was the only one living in it. She was all by herself. She had a little, very thin corn broom and a dirt floor. And her campaign platform was Deuteronomy 28. And what she said in PBS or Frontline was filming her, going around with her. There were like five different candidates. The whole slate of candidates that were running for office was like 28. Because they were all excited they were finally free to have a free election. And so Frontline was following five of them around. And they followed this lady too. And they filmed her talking to, I want to say, a group of people just as poor as she was. Who couldn't, I want to say, maybe 30, 40 people. In a little tiny village, you know, dusty, the whole bit. You know, they walk barefoot. And she was explaining Deuteronomy 28 to them, and they understood her. See, God doesn't need your abilities. And he can solve problems without money. This woman was happy. It was just I was just totally bowled away by this program. I want to say it was in like 2006. I've been trying to find, see if they put it on videotape somewhere I can buy it ever since, and I, I can't find it. Now, that woman is an obvious example of a God Deeds mindset, except she was a little confused. She thought that she ought to, you know bring her Bible into politics, which of course is wrong, but, you know, look at her situation. But the main point I wanted to bring out with her, with that is, look how helpless they are. So many people in this world, most of the world, in fact, are really behind the eight ball in terms of circumstance. So it's not, you can't say that their inferiority is their fault. I mean, it's always a mix. You know, it's hard to do the right thing. It's hard to, you know, try to advance yourself when you're living in a mud hut. Yeah, but those Kenyan kids sure were doing it, and they were big on Bible, too. Oh, that just broke my heart. In the heavenly state... Nobody 
is poor except he chose it. And it's not glorifying God. Now I'm not talking about monetary poverty. Okay. There's one currency in heaven. Doctrine. And nobody, obviously, nobody's prevented from getting it. That woman knew Deuteronomy 28. I bet you if I sent out a poll to a thousand Christians, not one of them would understand the import of that chapter. She did. She was explaining to the people, well, if God could do this for Israel, he can do it for, and then I forget the name of her nation. That was it. That was her whole platform. She understood it. So you know what? She's going to be rich in heaven. God's going to be working on that gal. And all the people that understood her. So a whole lot of us who are much more capable and had much better opportunities to study Bible than they did are going to be at the bottom of heaven's totem poles. We're going to be dishes. For all I know, I might end up one. So when I wash the dishes or I clean the house or I'm, you know, copying something, the lesson that I'm supposed to get out of it, you know, might be different for you, is what if this were a person? The legacy of the God deeds mindset is that you end up ruling all those people who went for works. The people who go for good deeds in this life, that's what they get in the next. The people who went for the word in this life, that's what they get in the next. What do you think peasants do? Peasants do works. What do the executives do? Executives do words. I mean, God could not make it more obvious down here. What did Christ do? Name me one work he did his entire life that the Bible records. But what does the Bible record? Matthew 4.4 4, You will live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What did Christ do during his ministry? What was his ministry? Talk, 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 talk. Word, 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 word. Analyzing it. Comparing one verse with another. How does this fit? How does this apply to this situation? How come you can't see? Like one of the things he said. You look up in the sky and you know what time it is. How come you can't tell I'm Messiah? All he did was word. He became what? The way, the what, the truth, the what, and the life. Not the work, the work, and the work. Not the good deed, the good deed, and the good deed. The way. The truth. What is truth but a bunch of words that happen to signify facts, principles? He became... What does it say in Isaiah 53, 11? By means of knowledge he makes righteous. Not by means of good deeds. So the God deeds legacy is that you become a king. And that's why you have to be trained inward, down here. That's why James just totally reamed out one of the nastiest letters in the Bible. Totally reamed out the Jewish believers he was writing to in the diaspora the letter is addressed only to believers it's not addressed to the unbeliever James is never talking about the unbeliever none of the New Testament books are talking to the unbeliever except the Gospels and that you have to distinguish one audience from another but all the apostles writing after the Gospels they're only writing to believers and what are they writing? words I mean, I don't know, can God make it plainer? The king uses 
words. He lives on words. He gives out words. It's called ruling. Ruling means you sit around, listen a lot, and make decisions. And then, you know, 1% of the time, the worst percent of the time, you have to walk around in all these pretty clothes and live in these pretty circumstances that really you'd rather be without. Sometimes it's nice, but usually not. It's a pain in the neck to have to wear all those clothes and care for all those nice things. But you have to do it because it represents the state. The glory of the state has to be represented materially for the visitor. And you have to, you know, wear really rich clothes and jams and all that other stuff because you represent this principle of the state. But it's a pain in the neck to actually have to do that. You have to watch how you talk. You have to watch how you walk. So you're not doing anything. You're on stage. Living in a museum. For the benefit of everybody else to look at. The ruler, the executive, lives, works, does, words. The peasant works with his body. So if you're busy down here doing your works and very proud of doing your works, okay, fine. That's the life you wanted with God. That's the life you get forever. If instead you wanted to just learn God, that's an executive desire. You don't think of it that way. You're just curious. Okay, but that's what he wants. So you're training to be a king, living and learning on Bible, which is what? A whole bunch of words that frankly don't make sense for the longest time. It's scary. Everything you got in this life is a training mechanism so you can learn how to use the words you're learning and how to better understand the words you're learning. So I wash the dish. I clean the toilet. And it occurs to me there are a whole bunch of people in this life right now that's what they got to do for a living to keep body and soul together. It gives me an empathy. That's the purpose of it. That's what Romans 15 is all about. That's why Christ went to the cross. You get an empathy for those who are not as fortunate as you're going to be. They spent all their time on the body, so they never developed the brain. The world and all its works get burned up at the end. They got nothing to show for it because their head is still empty or full of fluff. Full of false ideas about what the Bible says. That's so heartbreaking I could die. This is my absolute worst nightmare. The idea of preparing for a crown. I can't think of a worse fate in life. I'd rather be the dishwasher to be a ruler. Dishwashing sounds real good to me. But I've never been allowed to do that. And there are people down here who are as smart or smarter than my secular genes. Yeah, that and 25 cents can't buy you a cup of coffee. But there are a lot of people down here who even by the genetic standard of smarts, which is worthless, but there are a lot of people down here who are way smarter than I am. And there are many different kinds of smarts. You know, there's intellectual smarts, there's physical smarts, there's the put to it, you know, the tinker toy kind of smarts. Lots of different kinds of smarts. There's people smarts. I have, I have none of that. I'm people stupid. There are a lot of people a whole lot smarter than me, and they're stuck down here having to do body stuff. 
they don't get to spend the time on Bible I do. Now, if they wanted to, God would give it to them. But, but they're so behind the eight ball, they don't even know to ask. But I can ask. Because I don't want them being a dish in heaven. I would rather... I would ra rather be the dishwasher and have them be the king. It's so much more fun to praise somebody above you. And I have to understand that because that's the way they're going to feel. So this empathy cuts in two directions. I'm sorry, I'm crying, but this, this I cannot get over this yet. This is my big sticking point in the spiritual life. I'm really bad at it. When I go to do the dishes or I clean the toilet or all those things, what I have to remember is that for the people who opted for works down here, therefore they get the works they wanted. They wanted to be low. They were proud of themselves for being low. So they'll be low. And I'm going to, you know, assuming I finish the course and don't react so much like I'm doing now, I'm supposed to be their king. And believe me, I'm not saying this about myself so much. It applies to each one of us. This is what we all face. So I'm supposed to understand, when I say I, I mean you too, that these people who opted to be low and therefore get low forever, they're going to be really happy to look up to me. And I'm like, well, I don't want anybody looking up to me. But I enjoy looking up to someone else. How is it that I'm so damn dumb, I don't get it, that it's going to be an enjoyment to them, just like it is to me now? Or maybe you have a different kind of problem with this thing. We all do. We all have a problem with those above and those below. The ones below we get impatient with because they're not getting it. And those above we feel resentful or jealous or nervous. Take your pick. This is what we're supposed to be training for. And this is the point of this audio, which, ooh, it's only 18 minutes. I might actually do it short this time. The whole point of this audio is a God deed means you're training to be king. You are not training to be a peasant. Christ is the king of kings. You're training to be compatible with him. He should not marry somebody too low. And in aggregate, therefore, we, bride of Christ, all of church, not just some of us, marry him. That's the wedding supper of the Lamb. I want to say it's Revelation 19. We are in a hierarchy, though. Basically, everybody's inheritance, everybody gets his inheritance, but you get it either directly or through somebody else. In other words, let's say you and I, okay, we're going to end up in a kingdom together. Let's pretend, you know, God put this inheritance for each one of us. Every single person ever born, here's what God's inheritance for them is. That they become a king with all the wealth of a king. All the wealth. Each person born, that's God's will for their life. Because that honors Christ. You got to have a lot of wealth in order to give gifts to him, to, to play with it. And I don't just mean monetary wealth. There are a bazillion kinds of wealth, just like there are a bazillion kinds of smarts. Smartness is a kind of wealth, even. Skill is a kind of wealth. Health is a kind of wealth. You know that. Okay, so in order to play with yourself for Christ, you know, use all of your talents and abilities in the eternal state. So that you can, you know, because you'll finally be able to perform for him at that point. And you'll love it. Okay, so every single one of us who's ever born, human, believer, and unbeliever like, that's God's will for a life. A, the king with the wealth of a king. Okay, fine, but if you abdicate, 
what happens to the wealth that you are going to get? And Isaiah 53, 12 tells you. It's all up there, as it were, in escrow. I like to call it a pension plan because that's what I do for a living. In a defined benefit pension plan, the employer puts the money in, but the people who actually get the money out of the plan are those who are left at retirement for the most part. Okay, or if the plan terminates, then the whole pie is divvied up. Okay, according to a bunch of rules that the government sets. All right, that's what I do for a living. So it's like that. All this money is sitting in a pot. And I call it money for lack of a better word. All this wealth is sitting in a pot. And, you know, in God's will for each one of us that's got our name on it. Hi, I will that brain out, be a king with X amount of wealth. And then all these categories of wealth, monetary and otherwise. Same thing for you, whatever your name is. Okay? Same thing for every unbeliever. Okay? But there's an attrition. People peel off. So let's pretend, just so that you get the sense of it, let's pretend that God set up a fund of $100 billion. Okay? Let's pretend further that there were um, 100 billion believers. I mean, 100 billion, no, 100 billion people that would, humans born, okay? Because I, I want to try to make this simple. So $100 billion, 100 billion people born, means each one would have been allotted a billion dollars, right? No, a dollar, sorry. That's not good enough. Let's do it differently. Um... Let's say there were 100 people born. That'll be simpler. Okay, let's say there were 100 people, believer and unbeliever alike. There were 100 people born in history, from the beginning to the end of history, when eternity begins. And that God set aside $100 billion. Then each one of those 100 people would have been initially entitled to, given, not really entitled, given a billion dollars apiece. That would have been their play money for heaven. And of course, you know, you can't really spend a billion dollars, so it keeps on earning money. All right? So it would get bigger than a billion every day that passes in eternity. And of course, God, He's the ultimate usurer. <laughs> That's why there's a law against usury. Um, for Him, it's no good unless it's earning a bazillion percent interest. Okay, so we would be fabulously wealthy, all right. Okay, but out of that 100 people, and unfortunately these numbers are going to be pretty close to reality, out of those 100 people, only 10% of them are even going to believe in Christ. I mean, I think the percentage was higher in the ancient world, but in modern day, only about 10% of them actually believe in Christ. Might even be less than that today. But we'll be charitable and say 10%. So that's 10 people now. The initial population eligible for this benefit was 100. 90 of them forfeit. Okay, so are the remaining 10 each going to get? Remember the parable of the talents? This is the same thing. And the whole thing is said flatly in Isaiah 53.12. Greek verb there in the LXX is marizo. But it's the same It's the same in the Hebrew. Yahalek shalal. He will share out the booty to the great ones. Booty is people in that verse in Isaiah 50 through 12. Okay, so pretend the booty, including the people, was originally $100 billion and the number of people that were ever going to live, believer and unbeliever alike, were 100. But going by the, the the percentage which is at least plausible 10% of the population in history believes in Christ so now we're talking 90 people forfeited they go to hell because they don't want God where else are they going to go and their money comes to us 
And we're ten. Ten. Grand total, ten. Now, among us ten, this is where it really gets tricky, there's more likely to be just one, if even one, but I'll say one because it's really way less than one percent. There's only going to be one who actually becomes mature enough to be crowned. Remember, we started with 100. We went down to 10. And I have to pick at least one. But the ratio isn't really 10% of Christians. It's way lower. It's more like 1% of Christians. But we'll say 10% of Christians would be charitable again. That means that out of the original 100 population, one person will have become super matured enough by God doing it to him to actually be crowned a king. Everybody else didn't train enough to become competent at kingship. So guess what? They're the ruled in the kingdom. You either die out, you either die a peasant in God's kingdom or you die a king. There's no middle ground. You might, you know, get real close to kingship and then peel off. Paul did. And then he came back. So there's going to be one person inheriting the whole hundred billion. And the rest of us, we're going to be under that king. So the, what's the point of this? You have to think of yourself, and a lot of people will tell you you're arrogant. If you do, they don't understand what, what God's doing here. You have to think of yourself as a king right now. Whatever you got right now, that's your kingdom. Everything is paradigmal of a real kingdom. Every Everything in your periphery that you own or have control over or have authority over, that represents a person. It also represents things, but it's more useful if you think of it as a person. Because the actual population in heaven is probably going to be a hundred billion or more. Because the infant mortality rate is so high and you go to heaven automatically if you die before you were able to refuse the gospel. Okay? That's what, you know, David said about his son who died when he was eight days old. I will go to him. He will not return to me. That's, that's, I want to say that's in Second Samuel somewhere. Second Samuel... I don't know if I can say it's in 2 Samuel 5. Might be. 2 Samuel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's not 7. 2 Samuel 7 is when um, God promises him the temple. So, David had to become a king in order to learn Christ. We're all supposed to do that. In the Old Testament, this offer wasn't given to everybody. And David's offer, the offer to David, wasn't as big as what we get. I'm dead serious about this. This is the heart. I mean, I want to make sure you get this. I'm not trying to sell you on this. I'm just trying to state the facts. I don't... I can't say I don't like the facts. But I wish these facts weren't true. I don't like knowing the facts. But it is what it is. Christ is king of kings. He has to have a fit bride. That was always the rule. Okay? That has always been the rule with royalty. Or anybody in high society. You, you, the, the, the king shouldn't marry beneath him too much. It's okay for the man to marry a little bit below himself. And yes, he can even pick a commoner. But generally speaking, um, the, the, the lifestyle and the training for royalty is so tough that it takes a lifetime. It is a whole lifestyle. It's 24-7. You are never off the job. You are always on display. You are always living in a goldfish bowl. And you have to think, okay, I'm king of what I own. 
I'm king of everything I got. I'm king of all of my actions and decisions. I'm, I'm, to a certain extent, I have a rulership function, um, not necessarily over, but in conjunction with, you know, because kings are federated too. I have a rulership function in conjunction with all the other potential kings around me. How should I think? How should I act? How do I treat this this piece of paper that that fell down on the floor and I got to pick it up and use it? What do I do with it? Everything's a policy decision. Everything's a role. Everything's a rule. That's how royalty lives. There are a thousand rules that govern every little thing a royal does. That has always been true. You can't just do what you feel like it, like doing. Your life isn't your own, I'm sorry. You belong to Christ. Your life is not your own. Second Corinthians 5, that's the whole point that Paul's making. That's why Gail Ripplinger doesn't understand what Paul's doing when he leaves out the word Jesus in Second Corinthians 5. It just says Christ. That's his office. The person does not matter to Christ. He doesn't matter to himself. His office matters more than him. So Paul leaves out his first name. That's frequently done in both, well, in a lot of languages, but especially in the Bible. Old and New Testament. When the stress is on the office. When a husband says, my wife. He's giving her a promotion in his mind. He's, pro he's looking at her office. He's valuing her on a higher standard than all other women. When he says, my wife, rather than her name. It's the same thing here. You are a king in training. You are not whatever your name is. I am not brain out. I'm a king in training. I do not have the right to an opinion. I have them. But you know what? If Bible disagrees with it, tough noogies. If Bible said I had to give up peanut butter, boy, oh boy, I'd have to give it up. You know, it's like what Paul said about meat. You see somebody's, you know, who thinks that it's wrong to eat meat offered to idols. Then, you know, if the food's placed in front of you, don't ask questions. But if somebody says to you, oh, brother, you know, that meat was offered to an idol, then let the meat go. And sometimes you shouldn't do that, too. But in that context, you should. Your life isn't your own. You're a king in training. Sorry. That's the point of this audio. Look at your circumstances. Take the Bible you know. Use 1 John 1 9. Find your pastor. Start learning and living on Bible. And treat everything you see as if it were a person. What would it think? How would it feel by the way you're handling it? Does it need to be sharply treated? Sometimes yes. Sharpness is security to a child. Being mean sometimes is the best thing you can do. It gives a child security. It tells him the buck stops here. You slap a child sometimes. Not hard. You're, you're just trying to get the communication point across. You spank a child sometimes. That's security to the kid. It gives him a nice, clear boundary. Don't do this. And sometimes you explain things, and sometimes you're nice. Okay, what if everything you handled were a person? Or your dog? You love your dog. Or you wouldn't have a dog. Sometimes you spank the dog. If you don't spank him for peeing on the carpet, he'll do it again. So how do you treat everything around you? And you know what? You can tie yourself up in knots. Because no matter what decision you make, it'll be the wrong one. 
It'll always be partly wrong, and it'll, it'll always be partly right. Welcome to the joys of kingship. But that's the kind of mindset, that's the God deed mindset, that he's training in us collectively. That's what we're supposed to get. And we won't. So the pie is the same size as if all of us were each to be kings. But 99.9% .9 of us are forfeiting. And I figure there won't be but maybe a thousand, two thousand kings in church for all eternity. So all the billions of people in church, hopefully billions, forfeited. And all that money's got to go to the few. And, of course, it's basically, I'm figuring that the person whose inheritance it was, when he forfeited, is assigned to some king. That's the way it's worded in Isaiah 53:12. So let's say I was supposed to get a billion dollars, and I screw up, which is very possible, and I go all the way to the bottom of the totem pole. And let's say you're the one who becomes the king after all, so God assigns me to you. The billion dollars I was supposed to get goes to you, so I'm still getting it, but through you. So that's the way to think about God deeds above all. Christ was training to think. He paid for our sins by means of thinking. Isaiah 53, 11. And what happened? Isaiah 53, 12. He inherited everything and then he shares it out to the great ones the other kings who could be you could be me could be the guy next door could be the guy on YouTube right now who thinks he's an atheist and is busy saying how bad Christianity is but you know what maybe two days from now he flips he believes again and he outshines all of us and I might be the dish at the bottom of the dishwasher going, oh, roof, you know, like in Brave New World, and very happy to be there. See, it's like a NASCAR race. Everybody's going around in a circle, over and over again, having practiced hours and hours and hours and hours and hours off the track. But there's only a few winners. Think about it. Where do you want to be? Winner or loser? See Revelation 1 through 3. Peace out.